So like this morning's chanting, just this continuous recollection of Buddha Dhamma Sangha is a it's a way of <coughs> internalizing these you know, seeing the reality of this within yourself rather than just seeing it as some kind of uh, tradition traditional chanting. But it is, through the years, this chanting does have a rather good effect on consciousness, because in uh, developing a vocabulary, uh, in the, one of the great advantages of of a tradition, such as the like Theravada tradition, is that it, it is a, a kind of agreed vocabulary. It's a Pali is a language, a scholastic language now, it's not a living language that changes. So it kind of holds concepts and then to be able to use words in order to express, uh, have a agreed vocabulary, a way of expressing uh, and thinking that isn't just bound into cultural conditioning or personal descriptions of experience. <coughs> like when when one develops awareness, then we're coming from intuitive awareness rather than from personal experience. So when we express everything in a personal way, I mean, that's certainly possible, but it does tend to give the impression of something, uh, you know, re- reinforce the sense of me and mine as a personality is my reality, where the uh, poly terms uh, are not meant to be taken in a personal way, like Buddha Dhamma Sang is not some kind of personal uh, way of expression, but it is pointing to reality that we are experiencing here and now. So when I use this word puto or Buddha, this is not meant to be some kind of personal uh, achievement or identity, but pointing to the pure knowing, pure subjectivity before the personality arises. And this is like the intuitive intelligence. It's a universe it's universal intelligence, not a personal acquired knowledge. So I just keep pointing to this puto the, that we recognize through being fully present, fully attentive to the present moment. So then this this is like composing, bringing your scattered mind to this one point of here and now. So in uh, <clears throat> the present moment, of course, the, we're experiencing reality from this point. We, uh, each of us, is a point of conscious experience. And we're experiencing, we're recognizing Dhamma, or the way it is. Now that's different than me sitting here experiencing uh, my life through my memories and my emotions and my views and opinions. Because uh, I'm no longer 
looking at it in a personal way, and there's, there's my, what's happened to me, and the way I think, and what I hold is right and wrong. I'm getting beyond that to an awareness where the person before the personality can arise or cease. And that's awareness or sati sampachanya. So this relationship of Buddha to Dhamma rather than me to my feelings. And they, the, the different, it's a, a difference just in, in the conceptual level of taking refuge in Buddha Dhamma rather than in my particular personal scenario. So my personal scenario is seen in terms of Dhamma what arises ceases in the way it is, the way it is, the personal feelings, memories, and that arise and cease, not denying them or dismissing anything whatsoever, but changing from the high, highly emotive, painful, personal position to the awareness, the Buddha, knowing the Dhamma. So the reason why I'm explaining this is that how to use the Buddhist uh, convention. <coughs> yes. There's a it's a, it's a skillful means, it's not an end in itself. And it's difficult to, to separate, to, to, to recognize the difference between pure subjectivity and personal, uh, and, the, and the personal uh, feeling, the sense of me uh, as a person. The personality. <clears throat> That's why, just by a patient attentiveness in the present, we begin to recognize a natural state of being that, and be able to put the personality into a, a mental object. Right? Point to. Personality is a creation. It's not. It's not the the subject of anything. And yet we tend to interpret experience always through personal feelings, personal opinions. So now it's composing, bringing attention to the present here and now, the breath, the, the posture of the body, the mood. Just reflect on them, observe the, the mental state you're experiencing. And in this sense of awareness, and it includes both the mental state the posture and the breath. So it's not a matter of just going to one and and, then not paying attention to the other. Trust in the awareness is is that which holds, which you're resting in, in which you can observe the the witness, the knower, to say the emotional quality or the mood
the breathing of the body, the posture. Like, you know, the awareness, like this visual consciousness, I'm sitting here in this place, I can see the bell, the clock, my glasses, charging book. <coughs> and awareness means they're all here present at one moment. You know, so. Then I can, you know, notice pay attention to the chanting book or the glass or the bell accordingly. But this the sense of this intuitive awareness is embraces everything here. So I mean it's it's one is recognizing this is this is where liberation is, it's through the awareness, not through <clears throat> just going to one thing and shutting the rest out. Once I recognize this awareness as the gate to the deathless, to liberation, then I can pay attention to the things in that the, the particular objects that are present. So, so apply that, say, from the not just through the the uh, visual consciousness but through awareness, which includes visual consciousness, sound, smell, taste, touch, includes the mood you're in, you know, the state of mind, includes the breath and the posture of the body, includes the body and its sensation. Now to just reiterate the the attitude <coughs> and what a, you know I'm more interested in in attitude than in technique of meditation because meditation techniques you know there are some different teachers, different schools and that have different techniques means of meditation practice, but the attitude is, is uh, then the techniques, you know, whatever technique is, if the attitude is right, then the, then the techniques are, you know, can be very useful. But if we, if we don't have the right attitude, then no matter how, <coughs> whatever technique you're using, <laughs> you, you can only, you know, condition yourself, kind of bind yourself to a particular meditation technique, becomes you become, a, you know, habituated to a technique of meditation. Attitude is uh, then an attitude of, uh, say, relaxed attentiveness. 
sense of opening, re- receptivity, a, a poised attention. No, I find in this in this opening to the present moment, because I've been meditating forty years now. It's my my lifestyle. I'm a Buddhist monk, so it's a. If you devoted forty years to mindfulness, <laughs> so when I when I and I'm very much aware at this moment, they and when I just the bare attention, the mindful state of being, this receptive state, then. I notice the kind of background sound which I refer to uh, as sound of silence, kind of resonating, vibratory. Is it a sound or uh, whatever? You know, sound isn't quite accurate either, but it began to notice this kind of a high pitch and a vibration that's always present. Now I found that this, once you you recognize this, this is this is uh, the point that one is fully open, receptive. Because the when you when you recognize this <coughs> sound of silence, then you also, your thinking process stops. You can you can just sustain and kind of rest in the in this uh, stream. It's like a stream. It isn't like sound that like ordinary sound that rises and ceases or begins and ends. Like sound of the bell is a beginning and ending. The bird. <coughs> the sound of my voice. But behind that, all other sounds, is this sound of silence. <clears throat> so recognizing this then gives you a, is a, a once you recognize it, then we don't notice it. It's not that that it, you know, that we created or that it comes and goes. In my explorations of this, it's always present. It's just whether I notice it or not. So then, the 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 once I notice it. And it sustains itself. I don't have to create it and kind of hold it in any way. It's just 
present, pure present. No, and yesterday I referred to the the body as the four elements. The one way of investigating this, the in a non-personal way, the the reality of a physical body is by these four elements: solid element, fire element, liquid element, air element. There's fire, water, air. And these are using these particular terms of these elements as a way of contemplating this, the nature of, of your physical body in the present. Bones, the, the solid bits of the body, the, the liquid, the water element, the fire, the warmth the air, the breath, is uh, looking at the body in terms of, in a different way than if you evaluate it on a personal level, whether you're male or female, or young or old, or, you know, the way we tend to regard ourselves and our bodies as in, in these very personal terms. And then there's the space and consciousness elements. So the six. Earth, fire, water, and air, space and consciousness. Now notice that the the body is in space, isn't it? Space all around it. <laughs> space is ever present. But if we're just concerned with the with the things in the space, we tend to not notice or pay any attention to the element of space. And so this is, you know, now we're going to, to the immeasurable, because space is, has no boundary. Is it where the earth, fire, water, and air are contained, they have limits and boundaries and rise and cease. But just in terms of visual space, just being able to, you know, where where is the boundary to it? We can think the walls of the room, but then you know, contain space, but space contains this 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 room. There's space outside. Where does it end? You know, and we're not looking for scientific explanations about space, but just in terms of experience here and now, when we begin to observe space, we. We're not trying to get rid of the things in the space, but by withdrawing our <clears throat> absorption and fascination and and habitual and and habits of just looking at this and then that and going from one thing to another, we begin to notice the reality of space. It's real. It's not created. I don't create this space. The word space is a creation, but it's pointing, you know, getting me to look at that here now. This. So, 
recognizing, being aware of space has no other quality than being spacious. It is boundless. So you're beginning to recognize, say, realize boundlessness or the unlimited. infinity and consciousness is uh, <clears throat> one can see uh, recognize the sound of silence is the reality of consciousness it has no boundary because it conscious takes consciousness to be aware of this subtle ringing resonating vibration and as we explore that it has no boundary we don't create it like space it's infinite So this is like what awareness allows us to, to see, to know the way it is. Uh, within, the, within the limits of, of our human condition. I mean, we, when we are identified only on that level of, of I'm the body and I'm my feelings and thoughts and memories. You see, you're always limiting, binding yourself to unsatisfactory conditions. Because these conditions can never satisfy you, because they're changing. So when you're trying to find security and permanent happiness in things that are forever changing, you're going to be terribly disappointed. You're going to feel this dukkha or this sense of lack, you know. And we tend to take that as a very personal flaw. You know, there's something wrong with me. What's wrong with me that I should feel this, you know, lonely or inadequate or incomplete or unfulfilled? So you see, the Buddha's pointing at the, it's a human problem, you know, is this. It's the you know this is an ancient teaching. It's not a kind of modern New Age approach. Then, <laughs> two thousand five hundred years of uh, this teaching has existed um, because it's about you know the the human condition, how we as human individuals can awaken to ultimate truths. And as long as, as if we're if our identities are always with the condition, then then we we're always feeling some sense of lack and fear, anxiety haunt our lives. So in this uh, awakening, the Buddha. Wake up, pay attention to to life itself, open to it, observe, witness. And so just in this room here, you know, the, we, we observe the, the way it is on the condition level, the body's like this, the breath is like this, the mood 
personal mood, state of mind, like this, space, consciousness, We're getting the full spectrum, and from this point of here and now, in this position, whether, you know, I'm sitting here, you're sitting over there, so I experience it from this position here. <coughs> but you don't have to sit up on this seat here to experience it. <laughs> it's not the place, the attitude. So then the inevitable question of who's experiencing what? What is it? <laughs> and then you're back into the world of thinking again, you know. Who's the, who's the one that experiences all this? It's nobody. <laughs> it's not a person, is it? Because in the, in the personality arises according to conditions. So somebody comes in and says, Ajahn Sumato, I say yes, and then the conventional roles of being Ajahn Sumato can operate. But those are, those depend on conditions for their existence. But this doesn't depend on conditions for existence. So you're seeing it in terms of Dhamma, that all conditions are impermanent. All Dhamma is not self. Now, it took putting ourselves in the Buddha position, the Bhutto, the knowing position, because, you know, as a separate form, I mean, uh, being in a human body and a separate entity in the universe. I'm in that position of where the, the awareness includes, you know, opens me to the unconditioned. It's the unconditioned itself in which the condition is in perspective. It's seen as uh, aramana or it's objectified, it's recognized. So that from this awareness position, then the, then the five khandhas, the rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, vijnana, are recognized. So then these are the five khandhas, yeah, this is Theravada, language again, Pali. <laughs> Rupa is the body, waiting as translated as feeling, sanya, perception, sankara, mental formations, vijnana, consciousness. So then consciousness is, <coughs> is, is usually we experience consciousness through the senses, through, you know, being conscious of the bell, of the clock, of the glasses, or through the consciousness of, uh, you know, what we hear, smell, taste, touch, and then, then we perceive things. So the, the through the like the the rupa and consciousness are, we don't create that. If we that's the package we arrive in when we're born. Rupa vijnana. But then the rest is and then the the sense realm, the vedana, the pleasure, pain, neutral sensation through the senses. We don't create that. That is also. You know, being conscious in a sense, sense, 
sense form is like this. Then the cultural conditioning, the personality, the cultural conditioning, language is conditioned through after we're born. We don't come with with that. Now that means we're 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 programmed by the parents, the society that we're born into, our identities and so forth, our condition, our conventional realities, our program, like a computer, isn't it? We get that program. So now we're going back to before the program begins, to just the pure awareness, consciousness, that isn't, isn't bound, in, where we're not projecting or experiencing consciousness through perce- perceiving anything, but through awareness. So that's why I keep, keep pointing to this, the sense of attentiveness, a, a listening, like sound of silence. I, I, I use this, this uh, listening, that's how I experience it, by listening, like listening or Hearing means that, that I'm, I'm open on that level of this, you know, I can close my eyes, not see anything. Still, that sense of hearing, listening is still present, a kind of poised attention, and then this resonating vibration that is easily not noticed. If we're always going into things, into thoughts and things, then we don't, we just, we don't notice it. Some people have never noticed it at all. Now, some people, when they recognize it, they think they develop aversion to it. They think it's tinnitus or something. (laughs) I I was giving a retreat in the States four years ago, talking about this. And they, they... they, they are practicing the Burmese method where they label everything. And so they all notice this sound of silence, but then they kept labeling it sound, 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 and trying to get rid of it, you know. And you kind of, it's like, <laughs> you're not, you're not, you're just thinking it's another thing. Now I'm pointing to it not as a thing, but uh, that you, you just dismiss or that ceases, this pointing to a reality, something that's real, the way it is, how you relate to it, I mean, you can take an aversion to it, or you can use it, because it is, you know, it's expansive, when you, when you relax into this sound of silence. It's like resting and floating in the stream, you know, because you, you don't have to create it. You're not kind of holding it, in the, in kind of, and then it disappears, you have to recreate it. It's just learning to pay attention and recognize the, what awareness really is. Now, from this position, then you you can reflect because it isn't an absorption. You're not kind of sinking into it and 
<clears throat> and uh, you know going into a trance of any sort it keeps you fully present and then it and then the ability to reflect like right now I'm fully aware of it and can speak at the same time so so it's not not like I have to in order to be with the sound of silence I have to stop speaking or I can include everything here you know in, I don't have to close my eyes or shut everything out to to uh, be with this sound of silence in this stillness then the thinking process doesn't you know it can arise and cease but you're not caught in just the habitual obsessive thoughts like what thinking is is a habit you know so we when you start thinking then we one thought one thought moment and it connects to another and so you know and it's going from one thought to the next we become absorbed in our thinking our thinking takes over conscious is the, what we're experiencing through consciousness but in this, we have to recognize non-thinking. And as I said before, the self, you have to think to create yourself. As a person. So when there's no non-thinking, then there's no person anymore. And so this is like reflecting on that. Not anatta is like this it's not a, a kind of destruction of personality or a, you know a, a state of kind of uh, you know a kind of annihilation of anything like anatta can sound like a kind of annihilating yourself but it's not an attack even on the personality it's, it's a putting the personality into perspective so you're not limited to the habitual personality that, that, that you've acquired after birth. Now just, this is a, you know, I'm reflecting at this moment myself, just recognizing this natural state of being the puto, the Buddha knowing the truth of the way it is, knowing the Dhamma it's the point like T.S. Eliot's poem <laughs> point of intersection between the timeless and time something like that like this this is the point here this present moment from this point here is awareness of the infinite that embraces the finite and then this is this is the <coughs> this is the To me, the the great gift of being human, because the human, we can do this. This is within the human capability. Not to perfect myself as a personality, or, or uh, you know, become president of the United States, or anything great like that. <laughs> so the Buddha's teaching is, you know, is for human beings, so it's not a not an ethereal teaching for only kind of super beings. 
So just take for granted, that, you know, we're all here to, you know, take the three refuges, the eight precepts. So human beings do things like this. Animal world can't take eight precepts. And try, try to get the, the cat here to stop killing birds. Give him the first precept. And uh, because the, the way we can, you know, we might have the same inclination to want to kill a bird, but we, we can also reflect on that feeling. We see a, see a spider and we want to kill it. We don't like, we don't, we aren't into bird killing, not in England, but spiders, garden pests, things like this, are quite willing to murder. But we can also reflect on that, you know, the, the impulse to see some a spider and want to get rid of it. So this is a. So we can we can agree on, we can make moral agreements. We have a reflective mind. We have a we, we can observe this this impulse. We're not just trying to to make ourselves into a non-violent personality, but you know, we're, we're also observing the, the impulse, the violent impulses that we all have at times. Not as personal flaws, but as, as uh, impulses, things that arise and cease. And then agree not to act on that impulse. So this morning, this this chance to to explore this, you know, just to center yourself with the in the present moment, the position of awareness, res- receptivity, acceptance. And then focus, you know, from that position, then we can focus on particular things like the breath or the the body and the you can reflect on Dhamma then also as we begin to just observe the rising, ceasing of noticing how moods change and thoughts come and go and sensations through the senses, you know, uh, contemplating the reality of change, of anicca, and then remembering this, this natural state of awareness, which allows us to observe, to recognize, to witness the change that we're experiencing through the through the senses, through the body and the senses.